All right. Well, we are on chapter 12, all 12 of Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Mmm, caffeine. So let's get it started. Chapter 12. There's a little pop in that one. Let's try that again. Chapter 12. God damn. Let's get back this pop filter up a little bit. God damn. All right. <laughs> Chapter 12. Passions Return. As she dressed hurriedly for work on Sunday morning, Zoya remembered that Kostogotov had asked her to be sure to wear her gray and gold dress next time she was on duty. He'd seen the collar peeping out from underneath her white coat that evening, and he wanted to see it in the daylight. It is always pleasant to fulfill unselfish requests. The dress suited her very well today. It was almost a party dress. In the afternoon, she hoped she wouldn't have much to do and expected Kostogotov to come and entertain her. She did a quick change and put on the dress he had asked for. She rubbed it a few times with the palms of her hands to perfume it and combed out her bangs. Time was pressing. She pulled on her overcoat in the doorway, and her grandmother only just had time to slip some lunch into her pocket before she left. It was a dampish, chilly morning, but not wintry. People would be wearing raincoats on a day like that back in central Russia, but here, in the south, people have different ideas of hot and cold. They wear woolen suits in the heat and like to put on their overcoats at the first possible moment and take them off at the last. Those with fur coats spend the winter pining for the few days of frost. Zoya spotted her trolley as soon as she was out of the gate. She chased it the whole length of the block and was the last to jump in. Flushed and panting, she stood on the rear platform to get some fresh air. The municipal trolleys were all slow and noisy. They screeched hysterically against the rails at every bend. None of them had automatic doors. The breathlessness, tightness even, that she felt in her chest were pleasant sensations for a young body because they disappeared almost immediately thus increasing her feeling of well-being and her holiday mood. While her medical school was closed for the holidays, she found working at the clinic only three and a half duty sessions a week very easy, like a rest. Naturally, it would have been even easier without the duty sessions, but Zoya had already grown used to the double burden. This was the second year she'd spent working and studying at the same time. Her work in the clinic gave her very little medical experience. But it was the money she was working for, not the experience. Her grandmother's pension wasn't enough to buy bread with. Her own grant was spent as soon as it came. Her father never sent her anything at all, and Zoya never asked him to. She had no wish to be under an obligation to a father like that. The first two days of the holidays, following her last night duty, Zoya had not spent lolling in bed. She hadn't done that sort of thing since her childhood. First of all, she'd sat down to make herself a spring blouse out of some crepe she had bought in December after she'd been paid. Her grandmother always said to her, get the sleigh ready in summer, and the cart ready in winter. And the proverb was quite right. The best summer things were only in the shops during winter. She was making it on her grandmother's old singer. They'd lugged it with them all the way from Smolensk. It was her grandmother, too, who had first taught her to sew, but her methods were old-fashioned 
and Zoya's alert eye was quick to pick things up from neighbors, friends, and girls who'd done courses in dressmaking. Zoya had no spare time for them. Two days had not been enough for her to finish the blouse, but she had managed to go round several dry cleaning shops and had found one that would do, her old summer coat. She'd also gone to the market to get potatoes and vegetables and bargained there like a fishwife, finally bringing back two heavy bags, one in each hand. Her grandmother could cope with the lines in shops, but she couldn't carry anything heavy. Then she'd gone to the public bath. In fact, there hadn't been a moment to lie down and read a book. Yesterday evening, she'd gone with Rita, who was in her year at the medical school, to a dance at the House of Culture. Zoya would have preferred something a bit fresher and more wholesome than these clubs, but there were no houses or parties where you could meet young men, only the clubs. In their year and in their faculty, there were plenty of Russian girls, but hardly any boys. This was why she didn't like going to the medical school parties. The House of Culture, where she and Rita had gone, was spacious, clean, and well-heated. It had marble columns, a marble staircase, and very tall mirrors with bronze frames. You could see yourself in them from a long way off on the dance floor. There were some very expensive, comfortable armchairs, too. Only, they were kept under covers, and you weren't allowed to sit in them. Zoya had not been there since New Year's Eve, when she'd suffered a very humiliating experience. It had been a fancy dress ball with prizes for the best costumes, and Zoya had made herself a monkey costume with a gorgeous tail. Every detail had been carefully thought out, her hairdo, her light makeup, her color combinations. The result was both attractive and amusing and the first prize was almost in the bag, even though there was a lot of competition. But just before the prizes were awarded, some tufts cut off her tail with a knife, passed it from hand to hand, and hit it. Zoya burst into tears, not because of the boy's stupidity, but because everyone round her laughed and said what a clever prank it was. The costume wasn't nearly so effective without the tail. Zoya's face became blotchy with tears, and she didn't win a prize at all. Yesterday evening, she'd gone in there, still feeling angry with the club. Her pride had been hurt. But nothing and no one reminded her of the episode of the monkey. There were all kinds of people, students from different colleges and boys from factories, Zoya and Rita did not have time to dance a single dance together. They were separated from the start, and for three glorious hours they whirled, swung, and stamped non-stop to the music of the brass band. Her body reveled in the relaxing twists and turns of the dance, and in the uncensored, public squeezing and cuddling that was its main pleasure. Her partners didn't speak much, and when they did, Crack jokes, Zoya found them a bit silly. Finally, Kolya, a technical designer, took her home. On the way, they talked about Indian movies and swimming. They'd have thought it ridiculous to talk about anything serious. When they reached the front door of her home, where it was quite dark, they started kissing. It was Zoya's breasts that suffered most. They had never failed to excite young men and how he mauled them. He tried to find other ways to get at her, too. Zoya enjoyed it. But at the same time, a detached feeling grew on her, that it was a bit of a waste of time. She had to get up early on Sundays, too. So she packed him off and scampered up the old stairs. Most of Zoya's girlfriends, especially the medical students, believed that everything possible should be grabbed from life immediately and with both hands. In the face of this 
prevailing philosophy, it was absolutely impossible to survive the first, second, and third years as a sort of old maid with an excellent knowledge of theory and nothing more. Zoya had been through it all. Several times with different young men, she had passed through the various stages of intimacy, gradually permitting more and more, then capture, and finally domination. She had experienced the overwhelming moments when a bomb might have dropped on the house without making any difference, as well as the calm and sluggish moments when pieces of clothing are picked up from the floor or the chair where they'd been thrown, garments which otherwise should never be seen together. Yet they both looked at them, and by now there was nothing at all surprising in it, or in putting hers on in front of him. Indeed, all this was a strong sensation, and by her third year, Zoya was well out of the old maid category. Still, it was never the real thing. It all lacked that stable, deliberate continuity which gives stability to life, indeed gives life itself. Zoya was only 23, but she had seen and could remember quite a lot. The long, frenzied evacuation of Smolensk, first in the freight car, then in a barge, then in another freight car. For some reason, she remembered particularly the man next to her in the car, taking a little piece of string to measure everyone's strip on the plank bed and proving that Zoya's family was taking up two centimeters more than it should. She remembered the hungry, tense life of the war years, when people spoke of nothing but ration cards and prices on the black market, when Uncle Fedya would steal her bread ration from her bedside table. And now there was this malignant suffering from cancer, these lost lives, these wearisome stories from the patients and their tears. Compared to all this, the squeezing, hugging, and the rest were no more than drops of fresh water in the salt sea of life. But there were never enough to quench the thirst. Did this mean that marriage was the only alternative? That that was where happiness lay? The young men she met all danced and went for walks with the same aim in mind, to warm themselves up a bit, have their fun, and then clear out. They used to say among themselves, I could get married, but it never takes me more than an evening or two to find a new friend, so why should I bother? Indeed, why marry when women were so easy to get? If a great load of tomatoes suddenly arrived in the market, you couldn't just triple the price of yours, they'd rot. How could you be inaccessible when everyone around you was so ready to surrender? A registry office wedding didn't help either. Zoya had learned this from the experience of Maria, a Ukrainian nurse she did alternate shifts with. Maria had relied on the registry office, but a week after the marriage, her husband left her, went away, and completely disappeared. For seven years, she'd brought up her child on her own, and to top it all off, she was trapped by her marriage. When Zoya went to parties and drank wine, and if her unsafe days were coming up, she was as alert as a sapper walking through a minefield. Zoya had another example, even closer to her than Maria's. She had seen the rotten lives of her own father and mother. She'd watched them quarreling and making up, separating to live in different towns, and then coming together again, tormenting each other, all their lives. Zoya would sooner have drunk a glass of sulfuric acid than repeat her mother's mistake. Theirs was yet another example of registry office marriage turning out worse than useless. Zoya felt a certain balance and harmony in her body in the relation of each part of it to the rest, and in her temperament and her outlook on life. Any extension of broadening of her life could only take place within that harmony. Any man who, in the intervals between sliding his hands over her body, said silly, vulgar things on repeat, or repeated bits from a film script as 
Kolia had done last night immediately destroyed the harmony and there was no chance, whatever, of Zoya really falling for him. Jolted to and fro by the movement of the trolley, Zoya stood on the rear platform while the conductress railed at a young man who hadn't bought a ticket. He just stood there listening to her. He still wouldn't buy one. She stayed there till the car reached the terminus. And then it began to turn around. On the other side of the turntable, a waiting crowd had already gathered. The young man, the conductress, had scolded, jumped down while the trolley was still moving, followed by a young boy, and Zoya, too, jumped smartly from the moving car. It made it less far to walk. It was one minute past eight. Zoya broke into a run along the winding asphalt path of the medical center. As a nurse, she was not supposed to run, but in a student, it was forgivable. By the time she'd reached the cancer wing, taken off her overcoat, put on her white coverall, and run upstairs, it was already ten past eight, and things might have been awkward for her if Olympiada, Vladislavovna, and Maria had been on duty. Maria would have scolded her for being ten minutes late and severely, as if she'd missed half the shift. But luckily, it was the student Turgeon who was on. Turgeon was a Karakalpak. Uh, Karakalpak. Karakalpak. There's an asterisk next to that. It says a Turkic people who lived in Central Asia. So Turgeon was a Turkic people who live in Central Asia and always indulgent, especially toward her. He tried to punish her by smacking her bottom, but she wouldn't let him, and they both laughed as she pushed him away toward the staircase. He was still a student, but because he was a Karakalpak, he had already been appointed senior doctor of a village hospital in that area. In fact, these were his last few months of irresponsible freedom. Turgeon gave Zoya the treatment book. They also had a very special task assigned to them by Mita, the matron. On Sundays, there were no rounds. Treatments were cut short, and there were no post-transfusion patients. Instead, there was the added worry of having to see that relatives did not slip into the wards without the duty doctor's permission. But in spite of this, Mita usually reallocated to whoever was on day duty on Sunday some of the endless statistical work that she could not manage to complete herself. Today, the task was to go through a thick stack of patients' cards from December of the previous year, 1954. Pouting her lips almost into a whistle and snapping the corners of the cards, Zoya flicked through the pile. She was working out how many there were and whether there'd be any time left over to do a bit of embroidery when she sensed a tall shadow beside her. Not in the least surprised, she turned her head, heads can be turned in all sorts of different ways, and saw Kostoglatov, clean-shaven, his hair almost tidy. Only the scar on his chin reminded her, as always, that he had been a cutthroat. Good morning, Zoyenka he said, the perfect gentleman. Good morning, she shook her head, as if dissatisfied or doubtful about something, but in fact, for no reason at all. His great dark brown eyes looked at her. I can't see. Did you do what I asked you? What was that? Zoya frowned in surprise. It was an old trick, and it always worked. Don't you remember? I made a bet with myself about it. You borrowed my pathological anatomy. I remember that all right. Oh, yes. I'll give it back to you in a minute. Thank you. How did you get on with it? I think I found out what I wanted to know. Have I done you any harm? Zoya asked, quite seriously this time. I wished afterwards I'd never given it to you. No, Zoyenka. He touched her arm lightly, 
to emphasize his point. On the contrary, the book cheered me up. It was a golden good of you to give it to me. But, he looked at her neck. Could you undo the top button of your coat? Whatever for, said Zoya in astonishment. That clever trick again. I'm not hot. You are. You've gone quite red. So I have, she laughed, good-naturedly. In fact, she did feel like taking her coat off because she still hadn't got her breath back after running so fast and her tussle with Turgeon. So she opened the neck. The little gold threads shone through the gray. Kostogotov widened his eyes, looked at her and said, almost in a whisper, That's fine. Thank you. You'll show me more of it later on, won't you? Depends on what your bet is. I'll let you know, but later, all right? We'll have some time together today, won't we? Zoya rolled her eyes like a doll. Only if you come and give me a hand. I look red because I've got so much work today. Not me. Not if it means sticking needles into living bodies. What if it's medical statistics? They won't break your back, will they? I have great respect for statistics, so long as they're not secret. Well, come along after breakfast. Zoya threw him a smile. She thought she ought to give him something in advance for his help. They were already taking breakfast round the wards. Last Friday morning, when the day nurse came on, Zoya had been interested enough in the night's conversation to go along to the admissions register and look up Kostoglatov's record card. It turned out his name was Oleg Filimonovich. This rather heavy patronymic was a good match for such an unpleasant-sounding last name, although his first name did something to tone the others down. He was born in 1920 and, in spite of his 34 years, was in fact unmarried which seemed rather improbable. And he had lived in a place called Ushtetik. He had no relatives, whatever. In the cancer clinic, there was a rule that every patient's close relatives must be listed. He was a topographer by profession, but had worked as a land surveyor. None of this shed any light on the man. It only made things more mysterious. Then today, she'd read in the treatment book that from Friday, he was to receive daily intramuscular injections of Sinestrol, two cc's. It was the night nurse's job to give it, which meant it wouldn't be hers today. Still, the idea made Zoya twitch her pouting lips like a hedgehog. After breakfast, Kostogotov arrived with the textbook on pathological anatomy, all ready to help. But just at that moment, Zoya was running in and out of the wards, doing, doling out medicines that had to be drunk or swallowed three or four times a day. At last, they sat down at her little table. Zoya produced a large sheet of paper for the rough of the graph. All the information had to be transferred to it by making pen strokes in different columns. She began to explain how it should be done. She'd already forgotten some of it herself and to draw lines on the paper with a big, heavy ruler. Zoya knew just how useful these helpers usually were. These youngsters and unmarried men, married ones too, sometimes. Their help invariably degenerated into giggles, jokes, flirting, and mistakes in the register. Zoya was prepared to put up with the mistakes, because even the most unoriginal flirting was infinitely more interesting than the most impressive register. Zoya had no objection to continuing today a game that brightened her duty hours. Consequently, she was quite amazed when Kostoglatov immediately stopped ogling her, dropping his special tone of voice and quickly cottoned on to what was to be done. He even explained some of it back to her, he plunged into the cards, reading out the data on each while she made pen marks in the columns of the big register. 
neuroblastoma, he dictated, hypernephroma, sarcoma of the nasal cavity, tumor of the spinal medulla. He made a point of asking about everything he did not understand. They were supposed to count the number of tumors of each type occurring during the time covered by the register, with separate categories for men and women and for each decade of their life, and to list the various types of treatment used and their volume. Then for each category, they had to record the five possible results, complete cure, improvement, no change, deterioration, or death. Zoya's helper took special note of these five possibilities. He immediately noticed that there were hardly any complete cures. There weren't very many deaths either, though. I see they don't allow them to die here. They managed to discharge them in time, said Kostogatov. What else can they do, Oleg? Judge for yourself. She called him Oleg as a reward for his help. He noticed it and glanced at her. It's obvious a patient is beyond help, and there's nothing left for him but to live out a few last weeks or months. Why should he take up a bed? There's a waiting list for beds. People who could be cured are being kept waiting, and the irremediable and the irremediable cases the ir what? The ones we can't cure. I'm guessing that's like remedy, irremediable irremediable. Uh, but yeah, the quote, even the guy in the book doesn't understand, so I don't feel as dumb. The era what? The ones we can't cure. The way they look and the way they talk has very bad effect on those we can cure. By sitting down at the nurse's table, Oleg seemed to have taken a step forward in his social position and his general grasp of things. His other self, the one past help, for whom it hadn't been worth keeping a bed, one of the irremediables, Kostogatov had left it all behind. It was a jump from one status to another, quite undeserved, through some whim of unexpected circumstance. It all reminded him dimly of something else. But it was a line of thought he decided for the moment not to pursue. Yes, I suppose it's logical. Well, they've written off Azovkin, and yesterday I was there when they discharged Proshka, without a word of explanation, just like that. I even got the feeling I was part of the deception. As he sat now, the side of his face with the scar was turned away from Zoya, and his face had lost that cruel look. They worked on amicably and harmoniously, and by lunchtime everything was finished. Periscope go down again? Is Twitch at least still working? as it is.